I'm really glad that everyone's here to have this discussion on materials, specifically biomaterials, but like materials affect everyone's life at such a degree that I think sometimes people forget about it. Like parents buying a new couch or office managers buying holiday gifts or even the Olympic committee who is planning like the LA um, Olympics are gonna be the first zero waste and energy positive Olympics in 2024. And so like everybody is really affected by these materials and like what happens to these materials when we're done with all of these products. So I'm glad that we can have this discussion tonight. Um, first off, we're gonna introduce Jessica Aldridge who has had a lot of experience in sustainability and waste. So Jessica, do you wanna tell us a little bit about your journey? Yeah. Um, I. I have worked in zero waste and resource management and recycling world for 15 years almost. Uh, I am a sustainability and zero waste programs manager for one of the largest recycling companies in Los Angeles County. I have my own nonprofit, which is called Adventures in Waste, and it's just going through its, its rebranding because it used to be Burbank and Alliance. And Instead of uh, focusing on sustainability as a whole, we also um, helped start the local 350.org chapter, which is SoCal 350, and now I'm just focusing directly on waste and trying to, the concept is to bridge the information gap um, and experience and knowledge between those in the waste industry and the experience and knowledge of those who are just everyday people, and so that we can come to solutions. Yeah. And, and building a site that's a go-to resource hub, so it, you know, this concept of, oh, someone asks you a question, someone asks you a question, you're just writing everything down on a cocktail napkin and you <laughs> hand it to them. But in the waste world, a lot of us have that same experience. So the concept is to take that napkin and put it into an actual hub of information. That would be very helpful. <laughs> I, I forgot to introduce myself to you. My name is Ardia Denise, and I am the founder of Polima, and I'm helping companies find materials made from waste in biology, so having that kind of resource to to send people to, where we can actually understand everything that's going on uh, with materials, would be super super helpful. Uh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, so, what I would like you to kind of tell us, just so everyone has like a base knowledge, what is how is how are we doing with recycling right now, like globally? What's what's going on? Are we doing a good job? Well. <laughs> We're hurting a little bit right now, for sure. Um, there's an extreme global shift that we've never seen before. And uh, where we used to take our materials to be recycled, the majority of 60% or more going to China, um, 60, more than 60% of our exports of, of waste going to China from the United States to be processed in some manner is not happening anymore because that door is closed. And that door is not closed because there's a trade war, there's sanctions and all this. It's, it's closed because China has been on this path for the past seven or so years to say, we want less and less of your contamination and your waste. And when I say contamination, I'm not just talking about food being on a recyclable. I'm talking about metals mixed with paper and paper mixed with glass and stuff that we just can't really recycle. But we've been told by our cities and we've been told by everyone, don't worry, it's recyclable in some place in the middle of North Dakota where there's some guy who can actually break it down in his garage, but that doesn't really actually mean that it's really recyclable and that there's a global market for it. And China also, they want 20 skies, uh, 20 skies, uh, blue skies by 2050. That's their goal. So they have this green sword that says, if your contamination rate is over 0.5% for most of the product, we're not going to take it. And if it's metals, it's 1% contamination. We're not going to take this stuff. And so the whole globe is trying to find new places to take this material and have it be processed. And these, a lot of the recycling uh, companies, these small, some very large recycling uh, infrastructure within China have picked up, moved, and gone to other countries as well. But these countries are now getting this material and they're like, hey, wait a minute, we, we can't process this. We don't have the infrastructure here or what infrastructure we have doesn't take that stuff. And you see in places like the Philippines where countries like Korea and Canada have gone and docked their uh, bar barges of waste and said, oh yeah, it's diverted, we diverted it, we took it out of our country and we stuck it somewhere else. 
And then the Philippines were like, no, 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 you're going to take this back. So they just won, a gr the activ activists there just won a great campaign to get Korea to start taking this stuff back, and they're going to be targeting wow. Canada soon. So we, our recycling rate here in the United States is about 26%, and uh, in California it is a little over 40%, where it used to be 50% back in 2014, which is what it regulatory wise is supposed to be 50% or more. Mm -hmm. So we're going down and down because we can no longer say that a product is divertible and just go stick it somewhere and outsource our problem onto someone else's suffering, which is known as a, a form of waste colonization. Mm -hmm. We can no longer, you know, do this and be honest about this. Then we need to take this material back. We need to process it in our own country if we're going to be con if we're going to be creating this material and saying that it's recyclable. Yeah. And we need to build infrastructure here. We do. We need to do a lot more than that. Yeah, we I need know, to we stop. Do. We don't need to be creating this stuff in the first place. But <laughs> I mean, and that's the thing is now people are saying, oh gosh, plastic is so bad since we're doing such a bad job at recycling it. Let's stop producing so much and let's produce some new products. But what are the what are the issues with bringing in these completely new products into the waste stream? Like, what does that look like when they're at the end of their life? And yeah. what problems is that causing? Yeah, and, and just to, to say about the plastics, we've only, since the time that they have been created, since the 1950s, have ever recycled maybe 9% of all the plastics that have ever been created. Yeah, and the rest um, are in landfills or in the ocean. And made 8.3 billion metric tons of this material and have wasted 6.3 billion metric tons of it. It's, uh, it's, it's crazy. Um, and, and just another fact, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation through the, the, um, the new plastics economy are the, um, I think I got that right. <laughs> um, I am like rattling off things in my head. I'm like, wait a minute. Um, said that uh, the amount of waste that we're looking at creating in the near future, by 2050, we're going to have more plastic in the ocean by weight than we are going to have fish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And currently right now, the way that we create plastic is through oil production. And 6% of our oil production goes towards creating plastic. By 2030, it's going to go up to, you know, 20% of our oil production is gonna to go towards plastic. So we need to stop the source where it's starting, and then we need to also move into other options and opportunities. And first and foremost is not making the stuff in the first place, because we can't just trade one single use disposable item for another single-use disposable item, no matter what it's made out of. We need to look at solutions that say no waste in the first place. Mm -hmm. But then when we go into this trade-off of single-use disposable items, and or maybe not even single-use disposable items, maybe it's, you know, it's couches and it's, you know, it's chairs, durable chairs and couches, go figure. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we, we have to understand how that material is going to work within the system as well. Okay. So the people who are creating these materials need to be talking downstream to where that stuff is going to be processed in the end and if it can even be processed. So when we look at stuff like bioplastics, uh, material that's not plastic but it's made out of um, you know, corn or potato starch or whatever it might be, and they, they create a product that looks like plastic, but it's actually made out of plants, mm -hmm. can that material then be processed? Can it be recycled or can it be composted? And as we said, everything can be recycled in some place somewhere in the middle of the country or... This is recycled bioplastics? Yes. Upcycled bioplastics. Yeah, but everything can potentially be recycled, but is it going to actually be recycled? Is there a market for it? And with composting, uh, this material because it is a plant-based material so people think oh it's compostable and if it's certified uh, BPI certified biodegradable products Institute certified says this material can be composted in a high heat compost facility or uh, in some of them like paper products in a backyard backyard system. But do we have those facilities in Los Angeles? Yes. Well, we have them outside of Los Angeles. We have facilities that service Los Angeles, but the problem is the BPI certification certifies for a degradation of six months. So they, this product needs to sit, on average, the product needs to sit in the high heat compost facility for six months. Mm -hmm. If it's an aerobic compost facility, uh, with this, which is with air, could be wind row technology, big rows of what is um, eventually compost, uh, it's, it's a three month 
degradation process mm -hmm. uh, and because that's the process. They can get they can get um, the materials in and out. There's a lot of materials that are coming in with new legislation that's passed. We need to get 50% of the organics out of our, our landfills and into these composting infrastructure, whatever it may be. And so they need to process this as quick as possible. So it's a three month degradation. So if a compostable bioplastic item goes into an aerobic compost facility, it's probably, in the current situation, it's probably not gonna break down. And a lot of these compost facilities are gonna see that as a, either as a contaminant, mm -hmm. they're gonna see it as a contaminant, period. It's a, it's a contaminant that they accept and then they'll pull out, but everything that goes over the line at a compost facility needs to leave trash. as diversion. And if it's trash, it's not leaving as diversion. Uh, mm -hmm. The other issue is uh, given uh, regulation, if, the comp if they want to sell this compost to an organic farm or a farm that, that you know, uh, grows organic food, they can't have any inorganic material in it. So if the, and these bioplastics are seen as inorganic material, whether that's right or wrong, it's currently seen as inorganic material. So when this material comes in, they have to separate it out, put it in a different windrow if they're gonna process it like that. Uh, so it's, it's a very hard product to process and because of the legislation and needing to take more organics and turn this stuff quickly because we do not have enough uh, organics infrastructure in place. Yeah. Um, some of these facilities are going to a one month degradation. So an aerated static pile where they're gonna cover the pile or the pile has uh, aeration coming through it so it doesn't need to be turned. Mm -hmm. And if it does, maybe like once or twice. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna be a one month degradation with a little bit of curing time. So that those compostables, if they're certified at that six month degradation are not going to break down. So these products, these the building of these products need to have those conversations with the processes that are out there and saying, okay, can we, can we create a product that has a one month degradation? And can we certify for that? Or can we prove that? Um, can we use more fiber-based material? Yeah. Uh, are so. there, are there a rating, is there a rating system for degradation? Like how do I know, like say I'm going to the store, or say I'm a business that wants to find better packaging. Like how do I know what it's rated as? For us in, in the, what we get when, in the waste industry when something's brought to us, the only thing we get to see is if that thing's BPI certified. Okay. And that BPI certification, um, I'm not an expert in the area, but they, they have to go through a testing, third-party testing system to find out what the degradation of that is. So they're going to know that. The people yeah. but not know, investing. But not everything is certified, I'm guessing. Not everything, but a lot of well, compostable wear stuff is, is becoming BPI certified, but it's expensive. Mm -hmm. It's also expensive, so then it kind of prices some small entrepreneurs out of the market. Not surprising. Yeah, <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. Yeah, sure. Do you want to look at pyrolysis as a means to accelerate that? Yeah, so there's anaerobic digestion as well um, for organics, AD facilities, and the current one that's in Paris, uh, California, one of the largest ones that we have, is not taking any bioplastics at this moment. They're not even taking fiber base, from what I've heard. So even the pyrolysis, though, is not scalable at this moment. So you're talking about a product that you're like, well, maybe this will work so we can, we can create all this product and let's put millions of dollars into creating paralysis versus creating a product that works within the system that exists. Mm -hmm. So that, that's an issue that a lot of us in the zero waste community, which I didn't define zero waste, but um, we, we push for solutions within the situation versus spending millions of dollars to solve a problem that could be solved by product redesign. Yeah. So. yeah. So what do you what do you think? You don't think that legislation to deal with bioplastics is the answer then is what, I, what I'm hearing you say. What it sounds like is if we could create like a, a zero waste system that that would be a much better alternative. Uh, I think right now I don't see a need to legislate on the bio products at the moment because if the if the businesses can work with with the haulers and the processors and and they can figure out the system within I don't see why to legislate that there's need for legislation when we have situations where we have to tell uh, at the state level and at the federal level when we say you, you kind of need to pull these organics out of the landfill you know that because if we don't say if the state doesn't say you need to pull this organics out of the la landfill the jurisdictions the cities are not going to tell the haulers you need to start pushing 
organics collection and recycling on the businesses in order to pull this material out of the landfill. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we need to get organics out of the landfill, one, organics is the largest amount of material that goes to a landfill. Uh, it's about, for the state of California, it's 30%. Uh, and then um, that's all of it, including food, and food accounts for 14% of the overall. Uh, in um, the United States, it's, it's uh, upwards of almost 40% is organics in the landfill. And that creates a lot of methane. And it creates methane. What's so, the biggest, if food is 14%, is there anything bigger than food? Organics in general. Organics? organics in general is just, paper usually comes out pretty high. But uh, it's, it's food. Food's, food's a massive amount. I, I just group the organics together. So you've got your, your tree waste, your yard trimmings, your wood, and your food together. And the reason why that's such an important thing to target is our, we have AB 32, we have climate legislation, strongest climate legislation that's ever been passed in the United States that says that we have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2020, and right now I think it's 2019. <laughs> so, uh, but one of the, uh, the second largest source of anthropogenic methane gas in the state of California, and the third largest source of anthropogenic methane gas in the United States comes from the organics in the landfill. Yeah. And personally, we had to legislate that because I don't think anyone, any business or any hauler would have said, yes, we need to target that. I would really like to hear like what your dream waste solution would look like. The concept of zero waste is this weird, not understood, singular, blogger, pop, po uh, I idle, popularized concept, and that's not what it is at all. Um, in 2004, and then updated just recently, the Zero Waste International Alliance, which is the one that came up with the first peer-reviewed definition of zero waste uh, back in 2004. Uh, this is their, their newest update. Zero waste is the conservation of all resources by means of responsible production, consumption, reuse, and recovery of products, packaging, and materials without burning and with no discharges to land, water, or air that threaten environment or human health. So my ideal, and I wrote in my little notes, because I was like, my ideal right here. <laughs> my, my ideal solution is something that's equitable, that is scalable and obtainable um, for, for all of the market, and that does not cause harm to any community, that the community is involved in the decisions on how that, that product might be cultivated within that area uh, or mind or whatever it might be, that there's full corporate responsibility, that the responsibility is not always put back on the consumer. Um, it's managed locally, the waste of it is managed uh, locally with local infrastructure, and that there's, um, I want, I want B Core certification with zero waste uh, um, application to it. So I want there to be zero waste checklist that considers all aspects of a pre and post of a business worked into the B Corporation certification. That's a good, yes, that's a great idea. I and love I think, that. I think I can, you sense. know, some of those things can be attainable, but yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, 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 it's like a, just a really comprehensive, <laughs> comprehensive way to, for any business to work is to just consider all of those, all of those things. Can I just have something very quick? Yeah. Um, you know, I, as a product developer, consumer, and working, like, let's say, last year in a neighborhood, right? Like, asking neighbors to give the plastic, the cap, whatever we need, t-shirts, to make rugs and all that. I learned a lot about how disconnected and how we, which is a big problem, you know, taking the technical part that we discussed, how disconnected we are from each other. Yes. And the other thing is how people just don't think about it. So, you know, you just enter a supermarket, mm -hmm. you just buy. Yeah. So, as much as we talk, and I have been working with upcycling, recycling, innovation, material, blah, 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 for 20 years. And I go to Trader Joe's or 
you know, I go on the planes and there is all this stuff. Yeah. So time goes by and go to Trader Joe's. It's there, all the supermarkets. It's all the plastic. It's all the plastic all the for nothing. It's like one apple, you know, mm -hmm. one thing. It's all. So in this zero waste thinking, is there a possibility to have like a law that really goes into the manufacturing or the retailers that they really can have, you know, packaging anymore? Yeah. Because if we don't go to trade shows, I have thought about doing like with my neighborhood and putting all the, the, the plastic from Trader Joe's yeah. and we're doing like a a protest. So that's so Greenpeace, is, <coughs> Greenpeace like, has been doing that. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> yeah. yeah it, that, that's like the corporate yeah. corporate social responsibility of, of designing yeah. designing for the end in mind, right? And cradle to cradle kind of mentality. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's that, that there's is there for a long time. Yeah, so there's I legislation that's cradle to cradle. Yeah. I'm, it's there, but years goes by. Go to Trader Joe's yeah. today. So there's extended so there's extended producer responsibility legislation. It's very hard to pass. Um, they finally, after 10 years, got a take back program for pharmaceuticals and sharps. Um, it took 10 years because of the pushback from the industry that controls that market. And so you're totally right. And we're also not only disconnected with each other, we're disconnected with our product, we're disconnected with our earth, we're disconnected with the resources. Uh, so we look at places like uh, in the UK, where they're saying, you know, we're, we're going to move towards something where the products have to be made out of something that was recyclable, compostable, or reusable. Uh, Berkeley just passed a, um, an ordinance mm -hmm. that said if you're going to be a restaurant in Berkeley, you have to charge 25 cents for any disposables that leave your place of business. And it, all of you businesses have to have reusables on site that you can no longer use disposables. So there are small pockets of that sort of happening. Um, it's harder. Uh, California is a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. The larger the country is even harder. But it's harder. It's really hard to push on extended producer responsibility laws. So while those are happening, while we have entities working in that area, we as consumers also have to keep pounding that pavement. Because I know personally from working with Trader Joe's that they are hearing you. And they are looking at phasing out unnecessary plastic within their stores. Hopefully they do it. And it's not like just something they're saying at this moment. But it's, it comes from all aspects. But just know that plastic pollution, that plastic consumption, the single-use disposable consumption, even though you are choosing to buy that, it's not your fault. It is their fault. It is the, it's the corporations that are giving it to us as fault.